Good afternoon, evening everybody. It's Paul Woodedge again. It's World War II TV again. The first of four consecutive nights of programming coming at you and I've been excited about tonight's show. Joining me direct from the USA, Mitch Yokelson, author of many books, but in this one we're talking about tonight, Paratrooper Generals. Um, good afternoon, Mitch. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Paul. It's a nice sunny day here in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm excited to be with you. Um, Welcome to whoever's tuning in right now and welcome to whoever watches this um, down the line in the future. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, my pleasure. So, Mitch, you, you, your background is, we were just talking before we went online, you're, you're obviously American based in Annapolis, the heart of military history there, U.S. Naval Academy, you got everything down the road. But you did a lot of your training in, the, in Great Britain. You worked under the great Richard Holmes. So your interest in military history and your, your understanding is very um from both countries there so just tell us a little bit about your career before we get into the generals well to be honest with you paul i have to pinch myself often i've had a remarkable career first off i've been at the u.s national archives for over 30 years and for much of that time i became a specialist in military history records so people would come to me primarily for the first world war which is where i kind of cut my teeth and my came in expertise under um, the late Richard Holmes at um, Cranfield. But I got to know so many people from the UK, not just because of the um, PhD program, but just people who came to the US to research. And I, I made fast friends with so many folks and that encouraged me to do my PhD. And once I did that, um, was successful in getting the my dissertation published as my first book, Borrowed Soldiers, which looks at the relationship between uh, the US Army, especially two divisions that fought and served under the British. And then it just kind of expanded from there. Uh, having the PhD, I was able to get a teaching job at the US Naval Academy, which is almost down the street from where I live. And I've been teaching online through Norwich University, not the Norwich you know in the UK, but in Norwich in, in Vermont, which has a excellent master's in military history program. And just all of these things. And then I got hired as a, uh, a so-called tour expert. So doing uh, World War I tours from the 1914 battles up through the Meuse-Argonne, which was the subject of my uh, previous book. And then started doing more of the Normandy tours. And as you and I chatted before we went live, I miss this terribly. I miss coming yeah. over. I miss being around folks like you and some don't, of the Don't we all, yeah. It's, um... And um, so I'm just really uh, praying that all of this comes back and and it will all be a, be together again. But it's been a, a stellar career and I've, I've got to meet so many well-known historians, become friends with them, and I learned so much from other people. I, I consider well, myself- Well, that's like the thing we were saying, sorry to interrupt, before going online, that's the, the, the only pet benefit out of this horrible year we've had is the, the networking and how many people I've got to know and people like yourself and around the world who've been willing to come on and talk about things. It's That's the only positive I can take out of it. Anyway, let's get on with the subject of the paratrooper generals. And your book, it's not just about the two guys, the top bridge way and taylor it covers the juniors and, and gavin and pratt and, and lots of other figures there so but let's start with ridgeway and and um and taylor because your book delves into the personalities behind these guys and how they their upbringing how their experiences shape some of their uh, decision making and uh, so let's start with um let's start with matthew ridgeway give us a little sort of potted history of his his career leading up to the the, the normandy invasion well, Ridgway, um, I think most people know him better for his later career um, as a, a general who would ultimately become a corps commander. Um, he would lead the 8th Army as MacArthur's replacement during the Korean conflict. But certainly he cut his teeth in Normandy. And Ridgway, like so many officers in the US Army, he had not served in the First World War. He's a West Point graduate and a protege of George C. Marshall, who would be the chief of staff and, and lead the US in, in much of the allies during the Second World War. And 
as you probably know, and, and our listeners know, the U.S. Army, in between every conflict we've been in, gets decimated in terms of men and supplies, and we're not always sure of where we want to go. And Ridgeway's in the Army, and, and like so many others, including Eisenhower, not sure where the future is going to lead. And he's begging and begging for command positions. He goes back and he teaches it at West Point. He's serving around the world. He's getting his name widely known. And once the U.S. gets into the war because of the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor in December of 41, he's begging for um, a command position. And he ultimately gets it. Um, and he gets it as part of the 82nd Division. The 82nd was a storied U.S. Army Division, uh, certainly because of its um, fighting prowess during the First World War, especially in Samiel and the Meuse Argonne. And I think everyone has heard of Alvin York, who becomes this hero of the Argonne. And then Gary Cooper plays him in a movie and gets uh, an Oscar for it. And so. Uh, Ridgeway becomes assistant commander of the 82nd under Omar Bradley. And then uh, Bradley goes, leaves, goes on to a higher position. And finally, Ridgeway gets his command. And around the same time that this happens in 42, it's decided that the 82nd was going to become an airborne division. And Ridgeway like most of the army commanders at that time, and even the enlisted men knew little to nothing about airborne, but he's willing to take on this job. And no sooner is he the commander of now the 82nd Airborne Division, does the army general staff through the uh, infantry schools, and uh, they split the 82nd and take away a number of his troops and they form another division, the 101st uh, Airborne. And all of a sudden you've got these two airborne divisions and they're training in an area that, you know, the British certainly know something about the airborne and they come over and help. Obviously the Germans have used it, but they're not gonna, <laughs> they're not gonna lend any expertise but you've got this fledgling American army to begin with. And then all of a sudden, it's got this new component. And Ridgeway adopts to that very well. He's a hard commander. Um, one of the things you know, that, I, that I learned about him, and, it, and there's lots of material on Ridgeway. He's got um, a great set of papers that are in a repository in Carlisle, Pennsylvania known as the uh, Army Heritage Education Command. He wrote a really good uh, memoir himself. And then we all have, thanks to Clay Blair, a wonderful historian mm. who wrote an exceptional book about Ridgeway and his um, command in the airport. And under him later on is this protege, a guy named Maxwell Taylor. I'm kind of leading into him, but same sort of thing. He's a West Point grad, very smart guy, picks up languages like um, they're nothing. And he is eventually placed on the staff position as chief of staff to Ridgeway while they're training in the American South. And Taylor is absolutely in awe of Ridgeway. He comments in his own memoirs about what great shape Ridgeway is in and how smart he is and all of this. And and thanks to Ridgeway, eventually Taylor will move on to replace the first commander of the 101st, a guy named William Lee, who we could spend, I think, a good part of this conversation talking about. But he was the original, um, not only commander of the 101st Airborne, but he's considered the father of the U.S. Airborne. He's the one that kick-started things once he was given to go ahead through Marshall and, and Marshall staff. Unfortunately, uh, Lee has had a bad heart. And while he was overseas training, um, he had a massive heart attack and he needed to be replaced. And Taylor seemed like the logical choice. Ridgeway pushed for him. Eisenhower, who was in command at this point, suggested uh, Taylor. 
and Taylor would go on to lead the 101st. Taylor is a, a unique guy in the sense of I had a difficult time figuring him out. He too left papers, but nowhere uh, in the breadth of Ridgeway. There are a small body of papers not far from me in, in Washington, D.C. at the um, National Defense University. But as far as letters home, diaries, he kept very little of that. I imagine he, he created such things, but they were somehow they weren't retained. I was able to interview um, his son, who is a prolific author, and his granddaughter, who gave me a little bit in, insight into him. But even they admitted he was a tough guy to mm. get to know. Very quiet, very stern, um, did laugh a lot. Um, and so I don't really, I can honestly say I don't have a huge handle on him. I think if I was going to write about him much later on in his career, certainly when he was an advisor to President Kennedy during the Vietnam conflict, I'd know a lot more. But this period of, of Normandy, um, which he excelled greatly, um, he's, he's hard to get a hold on. I mean, this brings me up. I've been listening with, with great interest to what you're saying there, and I've, questions come into mind and ones I've already got written down. I'll just throw it in now because I was going to throw it at some point. You, you talked about the fact there's less information about Taylor's kind of personality there. And then you're, and you're also referring to the, the wealth of information about people like Ridgway and Gavin. Is it easier when there's lots of information? Because it has to be said that people like Taylor who wrote Swords and Plowshares and Gavin wrote his book onto Berlin, they're writing their books when they're still serving their countries. They don't, they're not going to kind of reveal everything when they're still in their careers. So as, as much as I enjoy their books, there's a certain amount of um, <laughs> manipulation of their memories because they're still, I mean, Montgomery did exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a standard thing, but is it harder when you've got this body of work they left themselves to actually get through the public what they want the public to know and what you actually want to know about that person behind the scenes? Absolutely, Paul. You hit the nail on the head. Just to give you an example, my previous book was a study of General Pershing and the Meuse Argonne Offensive in the autumn of 1918. Pershing had written his own memoirs, and they're exactly how, how you explain it in terms of Montgomery. You know, he was the hero of World War I. The Americans would not have made a major role if it wasn't for him. And, and I partially agree with that. But what really helped to understand Pershing was the fact that there were a number of other people that had commented on him around the time or afterwards that gave me other insight. Um, Ridgeway, I had that a little bit. For Taylor, for the most part, no. However, I stumbled on a unpublished manuscript that one day I hope to help publish and, and edit. And it was written by a uh, reporter for Reuters based in London and a guy named Robert Rubin. And jumping ahead in the story is one of the most fascinating things that I stumbled on for the book was the, the role that journalists played with the American Airborne and the British Airborne as well. A number of journalists jumped into Normandy in those early morning hours of um, June 6. A lot of people don't know that. This guy Rubin jumped in he sent a telegram back across the English Channel to say that he made it and what was going on. He jumped in with 101st, and essentially he was embedded with them, not only through the Normandy campaign, but even later on through Market Garden. And he wrote, again, a wonderful um, narrative about his experience in Europe with 101st. And he talks a lot about Taylor. And so I was able to get some insight into Taylor through Ruben, which and it, it was a just circumstance that I found this diary. But otherwise, unless you get that kind of personal insight through others, um, yeah. it's really difficult in my mind to tell a story because as you point out, these people, when they write their own memoirs, whether they're advised by editors or whether they do this on their own, they, they, they tend to kind of hold back of, of what they want to tell, especially if they're still yeah. 
in the military. Um, and, and an example about Ridgeway is um, in his memoirs, he talks about his wife and his kids, but he never mentions that he had been previously married and had uh, children that he kind of um, abandoned. And luckily for me and others, another historian, a biographer of Ridgeway found that out. And it, not that it's important to the Normandy story, but it kind of tells you a little bit about the individual. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, I mean, the, we, we, we understand, we, we, we study their campaigns, we look at the decisions they made, good and bad, and their leadership qualities, you know, good and bad. I'm talking about all commanders in that sense, but it's, the, it's always that background of the person behind it who makes that, who, 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 who develops into the leader. And Taylor, I'm not Taylor's biggest fan, but I always think that the difficulty he had is he comes in replacing Bill Lee, who was a legend. William Lee loved, you know, I've the number of 101st veterans I met who said they, they shouted Bill Lee when they jumped out the C-47 on D-Day because, you know, that's who they, he, they wanted to honor. And Taylor comes in from the 82nd. I mean, he comes in from the other team. If you're, you know, if you're a Londoner, it's like it's like an Arsenal player joining Spurs. It's a Chelsea flat player joining. You know, he's he's starting negative ten before he even starts because he have come in from the other lot. So whatever he did in Normandy, he's got to prove his metal. Whereas you know James Gavin Ridgeway, they're already kind of established. So I think Taylor is 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 interesting in that regard. But um, let's let's. Tell us a little bit about um, their character, their, their characters, their personalities. I mean, you, you said Ridgeway was incredibly fit. I mean, a great physical specimen, and Taylor had this this ability with languages. Um, what kind of style choices do you think they brought to their commands? Well, first off, they were in a, an incredibly unique position. As as I alluded to a, a few minutes ago, they're commanding airborne divisions. The first time that the United States military is using airborne and back in the first world war a guy named billy mitchell who mm. became famous because he was court-martialed for speaking out against the military had actually thought about using parachutes and, and parachuting uh, infantry behind the german lines but that never went anywhere and then here you have these two officers their first command as generals, their first division commands, first, of course, Taylor being an assistant, um, chief of staff, and then an assistant and artillery uh, commander is the airborne. So they they not only have to understand how to lead men in combat, just your regular soldiers, but now they've got these unique soldiers who are going to be, who are paratroopers, who are learning to be airborne. And then with Taylor, at least he got some experience under Ridgeway. So he could, Ridgeway was definitely his role model in terms of how his command style at least initially started. Um, Ridgeway could be very gruff. He could be in maybe even, you know, arguably mean, not the friendliest guy on the planet. I got the impression that Taylor was a little bit softer in terms of his personality, but very a very quiet guy. And, and as you rightfully point out, um, once Bill Lee is gone and it's already set in stone that both divisions are going to play a major role in Operation Overlord, and Taylor's got to take over a division where he's not entirely welcome at first, mm. but he's never jumped into combat. Yeah. He's seen combat along with Ridgeway in uh, the Mediterranean theater in 43. Neither of them jumped in. And one of the points, the themes that I, uh, I try and, and hit home in this book, and one of the reasons I wrote it, is to look at these two guys that said, you know, we're going to jump in with our troops. We're going to jump in to Normandy as well. We don't have to do that. That's not in our job description. Our job description is to lead the men, but we don't necessarily have to put ourselves in harm's way. And it would have been very acceptable for both Ridgeway and Taylor to have come into 
uh, Normandy later on after some of the exits and causeways have been secured and come in by either by glider, which the assistant commander of the 101st Don Pratt did, and sadly he becomes the highest ranking casualty of um, American casualty of, of Overlord. He's horrible, a horrible accident with the gliders. But in any case, Ridgeway and Taylor could have also come in by glider or they could have come in by landing craft and come on the shore of uh, mm -hmm. Utah Beach once the fourth division had come ashore and secured it. But they said, no, we're gonna learn just like our men. We're gonna go through an abbreviated jump school, but we're gonna learn how to jump and we're going in at the same time they do. And to me, that was just really remarkable. And it's kind of how it kickstarted me into wanting to write this book. Yeah. But to me, I think that 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 they're not stupid. They know they've they've been part of this building. As you say, there is no previous history of the airborne. They're they're as as Taylor, you know, the, the history of Rendezvous with Destiny, they're writing their own history because there is no history. They've built this this thing about the parachute paratroop credo they built this thing about jump boots and wings it's a new history they've got to embrace it or then it wouldn't wouldn't work so they've got to jump in to me they've got to jump in otherwise they've they've and they've failed in what not failed but they've built up this thing and they and they they and that's why they've got the press with them the press are fascinated by this whole concept of jumping out of aircraft and so it was ab it was the right decision and it was a it was essential they did that but um and Don Pratt, that's a fascinating side story. We'll do a show on that one day about all the various theories about how the glider came into the ground. And that's another whole subject. But sure. um, to, to, on, let's run through, before we get into the other figures of James Gavin and Samson, other people, run through their, their experiences on D-Day because they have um, differing, differing um, experiences there. Let's, let's do Ridgeway first. Where does he land and what does he get involved with? Well, uh, just... I think it's important just to go back a little bit for sure. um, more than a week. They're in these marshalling areas near the airfields in uh, southern England. And they're placed in these areas. They're pens, essentially, where you go in and you're not allowed to come back out. It's, it's, it's been sort of um, equated to being in a, in a prison, except that you know, you're fed and the accommodations are much better than a, a jail cell. But they're learning the battle plan. And every day they spend looking at these large sand tables that are mock-ups of what the Normandy beach has looked like, in, in this particular case, Utah beach, based on air reconnaissance and intelligence. And so they have a sense of what they're up against, and they certainly know exactly what the battle plan is because they're behind this. It's been gone over with their chiefs of staff and their G3s and their G2s and all of the operations officers, plus everyone from Omar Bradley's staff of First Army and then you know, down to uh, James Lawton Collins of the Seventh Corps, and all of this is planned. But that aside, they don't know exactly what's going to happen. Mm. And so, actually, Ridgeway jumps a little bit later than Taylor. His plane uh, drops him and the others of um, on, on that plane, and he lands in this abandoned area. And you see these sites every day living over in Normandy. So you can picture in your mind you know, behind these tall hedgerows and it's German occupied territory. He lands, he's got to grab his Colt pistol. The enemy is around him. And quite frankly, as much bravado as he has and how much he likes to talk, he's scared to death. He doesn't know friend or foe is around. The same thing happened just minutes before with Maxwell Taylor, who jumped in. He's landing on this ground. There's cows nearby, and he's thankful for that because the cows tell him that it's a relatively safe area. And then both of them slowly soldiers from their divisions. And 
we could get into a whole discussion about the missed drops and so forth. And I think we should talk about that briefly, but these guys are out on their own. These are major generals, but it's pitch black. They're landing in these Normandy fields. They've never been to before. They have a sense of where they are. They know where they need to go in terms of um, assembling their men, but there's gunfire all around. They don't know if they're going to make it. Later on, as Ridgeway determines that much of his communication, his signal equipment, his radios had been lost. The idea was that he was going to communicate with Taylor at some point, and then they were going to coordinate, even though they essentially weren't going to be fighting together. They needed to know what each each were doing. And that didn't happen for more than a day. Mm. But remarkably, by the early morning and the daylight, these guys are able to assemble a body of troops and eventually make it to where the designated headquarters were. And it, it, it's just, when I read that and I read the reports and I read their own accounts, it just, um, again, I, I think remarkable is really the, yeah. the strong word here. And that's the thing that's, you know, you've said about the plat, they've had incredible planning, although the drop zones were moved from the original sites, you know, not that um, earlier than the invasion. But the thing is, you know, when you're talking about the experience of the U.S. Army as a whole before World War II, as a general going into battle leading a division, you at least you are going to know where your headquarters are going to be. You're going to know where your staff are. As a paratroop general, you're starting off not knowing where they are. You'll know where they're supposed to be, but you yeah. don't know where your aides are. You don't know where your artillery officers are and your signals officers are. You've got to wait to every, and hope everybody turns up. And the thing about the Normandy planning is everybody has got in the back of their mind what had gone wrong in Sicily and Italy, where although the airborne had mostly achieved what they were supposed to, it was some very fraught starts out there. So the track record of the Allied airborne had been a mixed bag to that point. So you've got to go in there with this both um, confidence in the plan, but also confidence that you can make a plan work if the first plan doesn't doesn't quite come together immediately. And that, that involves, involves a lot of kind of um mental arithmetics and gymnastics that morning you know you've got to be prepared to think on your feet and to me Ridgeway Taylor Gavin and the others they all have that ability to think on their feet and appoint some very good staff around them and look at Taylor's staff and how many went on to great success later on Kinnard Ewell you know I mean they had an ability to pick amazing people so um the uh do, do we want to do James Gavin next? Do we want to bring other people? Where do you want to go with this? It's your, your show. You're the guest. What do you want to talk about, Mitch? Well, I, you're, you're on to a good thing. And, and it kind of makes me think all of us listening, including you and I, we've all been lost before. We've all yeah. used maps and we've driven somewhere. And Taylor, for example, being fluent in French, this party, including Bob Rubin, the correspondent I mentioned, they stop at a French house and ask for directions. You know, who among us has not stopped at a gas station or someone, you know, pointed somebody out on the street and said, can you help me? And so you can imagine what these guys were up against and recognizing the time was at the essence. I mean, the whole battle plan is the airborne comes in, they're leading the assault, the idea they come in on Utah Beach, and it's necessary to secure these causeways, the exits from the beach, because we got to get the infantry aboard. And then double on that is the fact that Utah Beach is central in helping the 1st and the 29th American divisions at neighboring Omaha Beach. So there's all this pressure. So it's not like Taylor in which way can diddle around and sit down and have a nice little breakfast and say, okay, well, we're here, we'll figure this out. The time, everything has got to work in, in, a, in a timed manner. And for the most part, this, the fact that the jumps were off and, and you know, we should get into a little bit about that controversy mm. in terms of the drop zones and the fact that so many of these guys were dropped upwards of 10 miles or more from where they should have been, but they figured out how to get back. And it was so important 
that the airborne become engaged because once the airborne drops and these paratroopers um, shed their parachutes, they're infantry and they're in battle and they're engaging and they've got missions to open up these areas to allow for the ground, the other ground troops of the fourth division coming ashore. And the fact that by and large, they achieved this on the first day with a number of hiccups to be expected is again, just amazing to me. And then um, you've mentioned James Gavin. Let's talk a little bit about him. He's kind of the hero of this whole D-Day. And, and one thing I, I also want to jump ahead is, you know, um, both of us, and I'm sure a number of you, the listeners, go with tour groups to Normandy. And Americans often think of only D-Day. They only think of the day, June 6th which Cornelius Ryan wrote about and did this help with the splendid movie, The Longest Day. And, and a lot of people don't think in terms of, well, D-Day was just the first day. June 6th Absolutely. was just the first yeah. day. It was a long slog. And they knew that with the exception of the airborne, they were only supposed to be fighting for a few days, secure these causeways, secure the exits, help the infantry, assemble the men, and then they were going to be taken back to the beach and brought back to England and for rest and recuperation and maybe come back later on. Well, they end up being in Normandy and fighting through the campaign for about 30 days, which is was not planned. And, and changing the, my tune a little bit, that's again where Ridgeway and Taylor are able to adapt using your terminology of these guys are smart. They're told, okay, well, you did your initial job, but we need you. We need you as part of Seventh Corps. We need you to fight on so we can secure Carantan and we can secure mm -hmm. the um, help secure the, uh, the ports and to be able to get more men, supplies, and so forth over. So all of a sudden, they become this important component. And one of the key figures in this is a guy named Jim Gavin, James Gavin known as uh, Jumpin' Jim Gavin, a number of nicknames. Fascinating character. Um, I knew very little about him until I started researching the book. I think all of us have been to Lafayette. We've seen the monument to him. Uh, we know that that was his, really without him at that battle and rallying the troops, uh, June 6th, 7th, and even into the 8th could have gone certainly a different way. But the background on Gavin is, is literally, as his biographers say, a Horatio Alger, a rags to riches. Here's a young man who is um, orphaned. He didn't know either of his parents. He thinks he may have met his mother later on in his life. She was an Irish immigrant. Who his father was, was anyone's guess. He never figured that out. But he grows up in this town in, in the, um, the coal mining area of uh, Pennsylvania, Mount Carmel. And he's adopted by this couple. And sadly, he writes in an unpublished memoir that uh, he's treated very poorly. I mean, very poorly. It, it's something that, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, if that came out today about a child being abused the way he was, uh, the, the, his parents would have been arrested and be a different story. And he puts up with it. He's got a fascination of history. He's a smart guy. He's got minimal education. But at the age of 17, he says, forget about it. I can't take this anymore. He hears his parents having one of their knockdown drag out fights. And on March 22nd of 1924, incidentally, March 22nd is my birthday as well. <laughs> Turns 17, he escapes his house. He's got money from a, a part-time job. And he gets on a train and where does he go? New York City, the biggest city in the United States, having never been there before other than when he was first adopted, but he wouldn't have remembered that. And he doesn't talk a lot about it, but he roams the streets. He's got no real experience. He's underage, he can't get a job. But somehow he meets an army recruiter 
who sees something in him and gathers him along with a number of other young men who have found New York City as a, as a refuge. And through an attorney, they get him to sign um, a waiver for Gavin, and he gets into the army. And he excels, and they see something. The army officers who are commanding him see this ability, and it goes back to what you said. He's a smart guy. And he gets into West Point, which is extremely difficult. He's got to take the entrance exam. He's got, again, very little formal education, but he's tutored and he finds a way. And while he's at West Point, he does well there. He gets into the regular army as a young officer. And it's around this time that he starts to have this appreciation for the airborne. And he sees himself in this new fledgling branch of the US Army and eventually talks his way into it. And his career takes off. And so I, I mentioned earlier about Bill Lee being the, uh, the father of the airport. Well, easily James Gavin is, is the son of the airport mm. because Lee is a major, major influence on him. And he's yeah. down at, um, Benning in Georgia, and he's leading a regiment, and slowly he works his way up, and he becomes an extremely important um, officer to Ridgeway. They would clash at times. Ridgeway, going back to the characters, wasn't the easiest guy to get along with as well. Where Gavin, time after time, you'll read about him as a soldier's soldier somebody who appreciated his troops and understood them. And, and I give a few examples um, in the book. Yeah. But um, a fascinating guy, he would go on to uh, become commander of the 82nd when Ridgeway is promoted. And then his career later on kind of fizzles out. Uh, but even a, an interesting guy in terms of his personal life, he uh, had been married, uh, but he had numerous affairs including uh, one with Martha Gellhorn, who is a well-known female war correspondent who, correspondent who was actually uh, married to Ernest Hemingway at one point. And then uh, Gavin gets um, involved with some Hollywood starlets. He's this really good looking guy. And I was fortunate enough, um, and perhaps you know them as well, to talk to some of Gavin's daughters. Mm. And really get some insight into him, you know, through their eyes. I mean, they obviously weren't around him during the Second World War, per se. One daughter, Barbara, who sadly just passed away, yeah, very sad. had published some of the letters between them. He was a very doting father in the best way that he could. Um, Marlena Dietrich is the one Hollywood starlet that I'm thinking of. But Yeah, that's, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, but a smart guy and a really good commander and but also i think i mean i'm gonna jump in here i think that uh, if bill lee is the father of the airborne i think i think maybe james gavin is the father of paratroops because airborne they're not quite the same thing i mean well i, I i'm fascinated by james gavin yet your book gave me ac um information i didn't know previously I've, i think yours is the fourth book i've got that covers gavin but He's an individualist. I think that's the thing about the airborne commanders is they know how to work on their own as well as work in a part of a team. And that's what they instill in their men. That's why when these guys in the 506th or the 505th land on their own in a car, cow pasture, they're able, most of them, to get on with their job, even though they are on their own. Whereas perhaps your conventional infantry engineers, they're much more used to being part of their squads, their platoons, their companies. And so Gavin, I can understand why there's a little bit of tension between some of the figures because they are, they're used to relying on themselves completely, aren't they? That's how Gavin's childhood, he had to rely on himself. There was no one else, you know, orphaned. The only person who's going to look after James Gavin was James Gavin. And so I think that's what he brings to the Airborne Creed is this, be the best on your own, be able to be a soldier individually. Does, does that sound right to you? Oh, absolutely. And I think you could say that, as you've already alluded to, for most of the Airborne. And, and and, and you're right, we should clarify, clarify, airborne is not just the paratroopers, but it's also the glider pilots and 
the troops that came over on these flimsy um, wacko gliders and the horse gliders. And um, so they're all part of that. We think mostly of the paratroopers, but also let's not forget the C-47 pilots themselves. I mean, that you talk about a stressful job. If, if any one of us wants to complain about our jobs and how stressful they are, can you imagine flying um, a stick, as they called it, of 17, 18 men over enemy territory without any fighter uh, support? You're getting shot at and your mission is to drop these guys at a designated drop zone that's been marked by pathfinders. And marked by pathfinders if you're lucky. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. And once you drop them, you need to turn around and get back safely because the likelihood is you're going to be taking another load, another load whether it's more right. paratroopers yeah. or glider pilots. And there's been a lot of criticism of uh, the C-47 pilots. And I think that it's unfounded. I, I've talked to yeah, a number of people absolutely. while researching the book. And I think the predominant opinion is that these pilots were the best of the best. They were well-trained. They were also smart. But you talk about having this assignment, this chore to drop them in a situation. And Part of the criticism comes, and I don't like to criticize someone who's not around to, to uh, support himself, but the late Stephen Ambrose, who I admire quite a bit as someone who, perhaps the reason why you and I are talking today, who yeah. popularized uh, military history, especially the Second World War. But he took it at face value when he met a number of the Screaming Eagles and the All-Americans as these... Um, airborne guys were known because of their division affiliations that, oh, the pilots were crappy and they didn't know what they were doing. They were scared and they just dumped us and we were on our own. And I think there were very few instances where you could point to that. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, I've had Adam Berry. If you're not in touch with Adam Berry, I, do, Berry, yeah. I put him in touch with him. But he did a show with me a few months ago and he's written about the troop carriers. And yeah, he, he is basically assessed the role of the troop carrier groups and said you know what all things that they did a fantastic job and, and the blame that's been put at them has is is mostly unfair and it brings me up to another question because i think now that that we're getting towards the final chapter of the veterans being around i think we're on the brink of a real uh era of a, a re-evaluation of the role of the airborne on d-day both both positively and in some ways negative. And I want to bring you back. We talked about the drop zones earlier. Because one of the, you know, in all your study of Ridgeway and, and all these figures, one thing that's always baffled me, and I'm sure some people watching here, is the 82nd had their three parish infantry regiments each land on their own drop zone. So uh, yeah. 505th, 507th, 508 had their own separate drop zones. The question I have is why were the 101st spread? Well, the 502nd got their own. They got, they got drop zone yeah. A up behind um, uh, the northern causeways off Utah Beach. They were up near Ravenaville and Foucaultville. But why were the 501st and the 506th split over two drop zones? So you get two battalions of the 501st and one of the 506th, and you get two of the 506th and one of the 501st split over two drop, zone, drop zones. Because that always made no sense to me. Is there anything in the archives or anything in your notes of these guys that explain what the reasoning behind that was? Unfortunately, Paul, the answer is no. Um, I never found anything. And then in anticipation of you asking me this question, um, I went through my notes again, looked at the operational reports, um, and there's a wonderful collection um, that I use in the book and other historians. Uh, many of these guys went on, like Ridgeway and Taylor, to Fort Benning and went to officer school. Oh, those wonderful and, officers reports from 47, yeah, 48. Oh, my great. Yeah, yeah. For both of those um, 101st um, regiments to see if they said, well, we were split up and here's the reason. Nobody mentioned it. It's, it's almost as though it was understood, this is what we're going to do as part of the battle plan. We're going to split into battalions into this area. And that's that's how it's going to be. So I, I don't know the answer. And, and I wish I could come up with something brilliant to yeah, tell you, I, but I don't. It's, it's, it's always baffled me. I mean, you, you think about Colonel Singh of the 506th having to make 
I mean, it's not that, but it's sort of five or six miles between drop zone C and drop zone D. But you just think to give a, a regimental commander that responsibility of two different drop zones seems to be added added responsibility that could have been avoided. I, I'd heard, and I, it's one of those things I heard it years and I can't remember who I heard it from. But I heard it was because uh, Taylor on drop zone C wanted some of his guys um, who were attacked near him some of the guys who are attached to the 501st near him on drop zone c i don't know it just it's always baffled me and i think there's some reevaluation of that would be will be fascinating and hope to come up with something another thing yeah. i want to ask you about no it, it, it's an excellent question um unfortunately as good as the uh, divisional records are in the u.s national archives they were all compiled after the war by the adjutant general and then they ended up where um I've been working for 30 some years. There are good reports, there are excellent records, but you don't have what you would hope would be meeting notes and sitting down and saying, okay, who came up with this battle plan? Mm. How did we decide this? It's all um, collated and compiled together as after action reports and unit histories, but you don't get a sense the nitty gritty um mm. talking about you know where all of this is put together i mean you have that for other periods i was lucky in terms of when i did the muse argon book george c marshall who i've already mentioned as chief of staff of the u.s army brilliant commander well he was a g3 an operations officer under pershing in that autumn of 1918 and he wrote a wonderful um autobiography talking about how he put the battle plan together and you see the pieces you don't have that as much you have all the shafe reports the supreme headquarters allied expeditionary forces for overlord including the airborne plan but it doesn't necessarily get into the nitty-gritty that we're going to mm. use this regiment we're going to use that regiment and we're going to put them in this drop zone and, and all of that if it's out there i certainly have missed it yeah Perhaps somebody else could find Well, it. maybe one day we will. But then my next question, which kind of dovetails in slightly, is, is about this whole issue of, of rivalry. Um, because there's numerous people been writing books and articles the last few years. They're always trying to find the, the butting heads. I don't just mean about the airborne commanders. I mean Eisenhower and Montgomery and Patton and Montgomery and Eisenhower and Ted. And, and I, uh, I've seen articles in saying that you know taylor and ridgeway didn't like each other taylor and gavin didn't they like gavin and ridgeway and um and browning because general frederick browning comes in the story because he come sure. he'd been to america he, he speaks to ridgeway he, as you said earlier you said about the you know getting some advice from the british what's your kind of take on the rival because i i don't think especially from your book that that there was much of a problem between these guys. I think there was lots of mutual respect amongst these commanders. What's, what's your take on that? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And I didn't see much of a rivalry. Now, certainly we go back to the Mediterranean operations in, in Italy and in Sicily, for example, in 1943, which was only the 82nd division. The 101st was still back in the States training. There's no doubt that there would have been jealousy amongst the guys in the Screaming Eagles that the 82nd is over and they're in action and they're getting the same training and they're getting battle experience. Um, but once they're both in England and they're both preparing for Overlord, I don't think they thought much about, well, what is the 82nd going to do and what is the 101st going to do? Obviously, Taylor and Ridgeway are in close contact and they're in meetings with Collins and Bradley. And of course, Montgomery is at these meetings. And, um, you know, one of the points we haven't talked about um, and we're running out of time, I recognize is Trafford Lee Mallory and his whole concern about the airborne. But just to get to your point, I don't think the rivalry between the two divisions actually existed at that time. Now, certainly later on, perhaps during Market Garden, it may have increased. Um, I asked um, Taylor's granddaughter about Taylor and his relationship with Ridgeway. And, and she seemed to think that while later on they respected each other, they didn't really have a lot to do with each other. And I don't think that they're their careers really passed. Um, they were both kind of focused on their own 
mm. own careers and what their own jobs were. There was mutual respect. And, and, and as far as I know, there's mutual respect between both the 82nd and the 101st. I think the rivalry that you know, people like to kind of create is a more recent things. And, and both yeah. divisions, you know, aren't even really airborne as much as they were before. I mean, I, I think, and I think that also comes in, in particular in peacetime, in the decades that have followed since war, when, when, when mercifully we're not engaged with an enemy, I think that's when more rivalries established. And I grew up in an army town in England, in Colchester. So I grew up, you know, when you went to the pub and the Scots troops were there, then the, the English troops came in, there'd be the little, the, you know, the, the scuffles, things like that. Yeah. Because there was no enemy. As soon as the Falcon starts, they all go off and happily, you know, work together. It's, it's, it's being bored is, I think, where rivalry comes in. And during World War II, no one can say they were bored. We were in the middle of fighting a deadly enemy. So I think the rivalry yeah. becomes comes post-war. Interesting you mentioned Lee Mallory there, because uh, I hadn't got that down as a question. I know we are running out of time. What's your take on Lee Mallory? Because he seems to be going through a bit of a negative renaissance right now. I know James Holland isn't a great fan of Lee Mallory. I'm not a great fan of Lee Mallory. Um, and he was very negative about about um, about the, the airborne operations and famously predicted before D-Day that up to 70 percent of airborne soldiers might be killed before, you know, before even hitting the ground. And of course, it wasn't that bad. Um, did it, did any of the the generals you read about, had they left any notes about Lee Mallory? Are there anything in there in their insights as to what they thought about him? Well, they, well, he certainly got on the Americans nerves for that reason. Um, Bradley, uh, and, and, and I should say that I think that there was a, an amazing amount of respect for him. I don't know a lot about his career other than during this period in the lead up to um, what would become D-Day on June 6th. So I, I, you know, I read as much as I could about his career and sadly he didn't live much longer. Um, I think he had the best of intentions. I don't think he was trying to, um, you know, really uh, tee off um, General Eisenhower. Uh, I think he truly felt that the airborne operations were going to be extremely difficult because they hadn't been tried before to this mm -hmm. to this degree. And it was his job as an officer to advise um, General Eisenhower of what he thought. I mean, Eisenhower appointed him in, a, yeah. in a, a very important role. And Eisenhower expected nothing but somebody to come to him and say, and to Lee Mallory's um, credit, once he heard that the airborne landed and that casualties were nowhere near what he had predicted, he contacted Eisenhower right away and yeah. apologized. Yeah. And I no, think definitely. that was very stand up. I'm not sure if Montgomery would have done that. It's no, I don't. I, well, yeah, I don't think we'll go down that path. I mean, no, I, 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 one of my other theories about them, Lee Mallory, as, as that, perhaps you are and James Holland, only for the reason is I only look at him in this finite period of. The, the few months leading yeah. up to D-Day. I mean, Lee Mallory is, again, is an example of someone who's been thrust into a role that he's not necessarily suited to. Airborne Forces is something new. That's not what his past was. Um, and and it's the same with, like, with General Urquhart in the Battle of Arnhem. It's that he's not an airborne soldier and he's been given a responsibility. At least Ridgeway... Um, Taylor and Gavin had had those months of of time in the in the USA to get to understand how to use airborne forces and then go and therefore deploy airborne forces. I mean, I've always thought about Lee Mallory whether his role, even you know, in like in on Eisenhower's staff, isn't just there because he's a bit negative. Because in that environment, if you're Eisenhower and you've got all these people there, you don't want just yes men around you being excited about everything. You need that conscience of someone going, "Have you thought this through? Have you thought about the uh, the alternative options there?" And I I think Lee Mallory definitely serves a purpose by being a bit negative to give that counterpoint to help Eisenhower make decisions to help him, you know, even out things. And I think maybe that's that's a role he served. But yeah, I, I, anyway, well, we're here to talk um, about airborne generals. I no, want you as we're running out of time. Yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. And, and just one other point: Eisenhower wasn't all that certain about the airborne either. No, um, there's plenty where he said um, in meeting notes that he was concerned not just about the airborne at Normandy, but he, you know, he, he grew up on the frontier. He had a long career. 
he wasn't um, all of that um, uh, keen about the um, airborne as well. And I don't know, maybe um, Mallory kind of uh, Lee Mallory played into that and in hoping he'd have more of an influence. And to Eisenhower's credit, he listened. He didn't come back with an immediate response, but he thought mm -hmm. about it over numerous cigarettes and reading um, uh, Westerns and hanging out with um, his beautiful aide. And um, I think it ultimately was the right decision, but you've also got people like Bradley and also Montgomery who are saying without the airborne, Utah Beach, we can't have the landings yep. at Utah Beach. Yep, we and a lot of people have asked, I know we're running out about Omaha and why there wasn't airborne there. And I don't know a lot of the reason other than the fact that there just weren't enough. There weren't enough. Yeah, just there's no, there's no other spares either. There. If, there, if we no had another division spare. up our sleeves, maybe. But um, And it was a different sort of terrain yep. in, in a sense. But um, it's, it's an interesting theory. And, you know, would Omaha had been more successful? Would casualties have been lighter? If airborne had preceded the uh, landings like they did it at Utah, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But before we um, bring things down, because you, your book doesn't just cover the, the guys at top. There's also other figures in there. Who's the real unsung hero that you wrote about in your book that we should know more about? I know you mentioned me like Francis Sampson and others, but give me give me one hero that, that my viewers should 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 read more about. Well, there isn't a lot written about him, but a guy named Barney Oldfield. Oldfield was a lieutenant colonel. He was in the press corps. He had worked for um, Fort Gavin down at, at Benning and then eventually became part of the chief staff. He's the one that really came up with the with a wonderful idea to get journalists to jump into Normandy because it was Eisenhower really we, you know, we talk a lot about transparency these days and what our governments want us to know and don't want us to know. Eisenhower was very, very careful. He wanted the American people to know what was going on as much as possible. And he stood behind the idea of dropping journalists in who would write about the airborne attack. And then, as we like to use the term today, it'd be embedded with the troops. So mm -hmm. this guy, Oldfield, he wrote his memoirs, which are okay, and he's written another book, but he's somebody that needs more exploration, and I've been through his papers. But the fact that he's a large reason, I believe, that we know so much about the Airborne, because the journalists wrote these articles, helped get the story out early. And one of the guys that I talk about at the very beginning of the book was another journalist who didn't drop, a guy named Wright Bryan from the Atlanta Constitution, a newspaper. He witnessed um, a stick of the um, 101st read by, uh, led by Lieutenant Colonel Cole. And he gave the first on-air account of the airborne landings right after um, Eisenhower's um, you know, speech and Churchill and so forth. And these guys in, in a way, even though they weren't carrying guns and they weren't in the mix in the battle, although Wright Bryan later on would become embedded and he became taken as a POW, their, their importance during the airborne um, operations for Normandy were extremely important. No, definitely. I mean, I think of those, the British journalists that were embedded on the gliders with, with the guys up at Pegasus Bridge near there. There's yeah. some of those, those audio files you can find online are amazingly vivid describing those, those journeys in there. It's, uh, we're grateful that some of those people, um, Richard Dimbleby was with the British Airborne on D-Day sure. and, and, and they they left us an important um, archive of, of, of testimony. So yeah, it's been a great chat. I'm amazed how quickly the time has flown today yeah. because I mean, there's the thing is there's so many people we can talk about so many different angles there. Um, I, I, it's been great talking to you, Mitch, and we'll have you on again to talk about something else. Um, for those again, watching, um, it's not just, as I say, it's not, that's why we've struggled to keep to, to the one subject tonight because the book does cover more than just Ridgeway and Gavin. It goes off down all these rabbit holes of other people like the chaplain, Francis Sampson and the, the journalists. And, uh, so it's, it's, it, and also covers the, the normal operations. So it's, uh, it's definitely worth getting folks. And, um, yeah, will you, will you come on and do something else with us again, Mitch? I would love to, Paul. This has been a real thrill, and I appreciate what you've done for us military historians and 
the, the history community during this um, unprecedented time, both with the pandemic and what's going on politically in the U.S. You, you've been a bright light and thank you. And I'll, I'll come on anytime you, you ask. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Well, in terms of those watching, this is the, the first of four consecutive nights of shows. Tomorrow night, we've got the incredible Alex Kershaw coming on talking about the Liberator. Then the next day, we've got uh, Marty Morgan coming on about what really did happen in San Mary Glees and those sticks there and the famous stories of the bell tower. And then finally, on the fourth day, we've got David O'Keefe following up with more information about Dieppe Ray. Then lots more coming up over the next few weeks. I, I urge everybody, please join up with us on the Patreon. Patreon. Please subscribe to the channel. The links to people's books are in the in the description below we've got lots of exciting shows coming up just planned great escape week in march we've got poland at war week in march we've got the swing music shows coming up we've got the iwo jima week in february we've got uh burma week in february I mean, it's all it's all happening here folks so make sure you stay subscribed so you'll find out what's happening next follow me on twitter follow me on facebook mitch it's been a pleasure talking to you i'll let you enjoy your afternoon and i might go and have a little quick cheeky beer um it's been great. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. Thank you. I will Thank see you all again on World War II right. TV very shortly.